Hello everyone. I'm on the UK government COVID database um, here. It's a fantastic website. I recommend people to check it out. Um, and what you've got is you've got information on cases, unfortunate deaths, healthcare, virus tests and vaccinations. And so what I'm going to do today is show you a bit of analysis I've done looking at this data. You can click on any of these um, to get the information and then if it works yes then you can download that um, down so you can get a CSV of all that data and that's what I've done I've just gone in and got the various bits of information from that website I've um, got it a couple of days ago so I could do the analysis I'm just going to talk you through what I as someone who works as naturally has done with that data to um, try and draw some conclusions and, and get some comfort for myself if I flick into my spreadsheet what I've got here, make this a bit bigger, is by date, various pieces of information. So number of cases, um, number of tests done, uh, unfortunately the deaths by date, um, and then the vaccinations. So the percentage of UK adults have had a first vaccination and percentage have had a second. I've highlighted a few things here in grey. So um, the website does say that the cases and deaths data comes in over time. So be very careful using the last five days. Now, I could as an actuary get lots of history and see how those numbers develop and do a projection. Um, quite simple using a chain ladder method, which um, other videos on my on my YouTube site you can see me talking about. But actually, the aim as an actuary is to build the simplest model that um, predicts the future and represents the real world. So. Um, it's actually a fair bit of work to get all that data and build that model and it's only five days of data which I can just ignore. So my plan in this model is just, just to take the data as it is, don't do any transformation of that data. So I'm going to get rid of this grey highlighted information, but I, I don't think it's really going to cause any um, problems with my analysis. So if I go on to the next tab, um, I've cleaned the data, but basically what I've done is I've deleted um, the, the last five days of information on the, the cases of the deaths. Um, and what I've done is over here is I've just done a few calculations. So I've worked out what the positive case rate is. So just looking at the number of cases reported divided by the test done on that on that date. And you can see there's incredibly low at the moment. And the first thing I want to do is try and investigate the relationship between the cases and unfortunately people dying um, and we we know that um, it's not something which just takes you out immediately um, there is a lag and you know I've, I've heard various numbers um, talked about and uh, I'm going to test whether a one week lag a two week lag three etc um, is the appropriate relationship to assume between between those two measures and that can be useful for them predicting what's going to happen um, in the days and weeks after after case numbers um, potentially increasing. So on my next tab, I'm just plotting out the information I've got. So this this is the information which which is um, got from the NHS website, which um, charts that look a lot like this, and um, Firstly, we've got cases. So you can see in the UK, um, back in back in March 2020, we didn't have much much information. So it looked like a, a very low peak compared to what we've seen um, recently. So we obviously had um, towards the back end of 2020 an increase, and then unfortunately the uh, the alpha variant um, really came in, and I think there was potentially a little bit of uh, lockdown fatigue around Christmas, and, and you know the numbers really shot up, um, and you know we've been in lockdown. Um, in some way, shape or form pretty much since then. Um, and now we're at some very low levels, although there's, there's starting to be some some impact from the from the Delta variant, the one that's um, just just been uh, just hit our shores in the last month or so. Um, in terms of tests, so uh, number of tests was in, was incredibly uh, incredibly low relative to now. Uh, there was a lot of fighting about whether we get to 100,000 tests a day back in um, the sort of spring 2020. And, you know, if you look at it now, you know, since 2021 happened, we're doing about a million a day. Um, you know, it's fantastic effort. And, you know, I, 
I can do them at home now. You don't have to go anywhere. You can get a rapid test. You can get detailed tests. There's, there's lots of uh, potential there for people to ensure that they're they're being tested and safe to meet relatives, go to work, whatever it might be. If we look at um, you know the uh, the death data, so we had a pretty bad first wave, getting up to about a thousand a day, and then it then it fell right back down before getting to the. The, the second wave was was even worse and we peaked at almost 1400 deaths a day which was obviously horrific and you know naturally we need to go into into lockdown and now we're back back right down almost at, at zero in fact we had a, a zero death day only a, only a day or so ago which was fantastic but clearly a bit of a bit of an outlier um and the question is are we are we going into a third wave or are we going to have lots more cases lots more hospitalizations and deaths um and one thing hopefully that will uh, prevent that is the, the mass vaccination. So the NHS in the UK has been doing a fantastic job of getting people vaccinated and they've done it on a, a risk assessed basis. So um, it's not been a free for all. They've deliberately targeted people in I think about nine different categories and they, they steadily got through giving everyone a first vaccine in those in those bands and um, then they've opened it up to, to other people. And um, you know, about three months after that started, they then kicked off with the second vaccinations, and you can see they're they're pretty close to fifty percent of people having a having a second vaccination. And this is it's worth noting this is adult population, um, so fifty percent of adults only currently um, in the UK. No one under eighteen, possibly under sixteen, is being vaccinated. So let's have a look um, at the first thing I've done. So I've just tried to do a correlation. Um, between the number of deaths and the uh, positive case rate. So we, we saw a little while ago, we're down at sort of 0.3% um, of tests resulting in a positive case. So um, what I've done is a very simple um, correlation between the series of data um, looking at positive case rates and the series of data looking at um, the deaths. And um, all I've done is then looked at it by absolute data, lagging the cases by a week, two weeks, et cetera, et cetera. And I've got three potential choices on where to apply that data. So I can look at all the historical data, but we know that we weren't really testing people very heavily for most of 2020. And so there's there's um, a distortion in the case numbers relative to deaths, which, you know, unfortunately, you can't really hide those whether you test or not, they, they're, they're there. Um, we took it 2021. Um, did have a bit of an issue with the NHS almost getting um, overloaded in really early in um, 21 due to the um, the alpha variant and the, just the very high case numbers. So um, it's probably actually better to just look at about the 20th of January onwards because by that point, although cases and uh, deaths and hospitalizations were high, there was a little bit more control over the situation and things were improving. So um, it's my intention to just look at the 20th of January data onwards. Um, and if I look at correlations, they're all pretty high, but um, just about willing is the is a two week lag. And um, I've heard quite a lot of um, people, experts talking about this, and the two week lag is something which has been mentioned a lot. So I think I'm going to go for that. The two week lag between um, case, cases and deaths is my conclusion. And you can see this is the comparison of the the positive case rate, which, like I say, is very close to zero now, and, and the deaths, which have come down from horrific um, numbers early in 2021, down to, to to very close to to zero. Um, and you know, I don't want to um, underplay it. You know, any anyone who dies is a complete disaster, and you know, I'd hate it if anyone um, close to me it happened to. So you know, I'm, I'm not saying that no low deaths is uh, is not a problem. It clearly is, um, but it's really great to see that it that it's come right down from the, the horrific levels we were seeing only a few months ago. So what I've then done is I've said, okay, we've got um, our deaths and we've got our positive case rate. Um, let's look at the ratio of those two. So take the deaths on any one day divided by the the positive case rate um, lagged by two weeks. As we've just demonstrated, that's the most appropriate measure. And you could divide those two and come up with this fairly arbitrary set of numbers, uh, which are currently around about two, three thousand. But you know, once upon a time, we're up at sort of 15, 20,000. Um, and just to make that a little bit more contextual, um, I've now 
indexed everything in this column to the 20th of January. So I'm saying let, that's our starting point, 20th of January, let's call that 100% and then everything else is relative to that. And so even though we had a fantastic correlation, 98% correlation between those two sets of data, you can see there's still quite um, an impact in the, the number of deaths has fallen very sharply relative to the number of cases. So even though cases have really fallen, um, the number of deaths has fallen even further. So, you know, only about 20% of um, the people who might have died uh, at the start of January, uh, late January, and are now dying. So I think that's due to vaccination. So I'm going to do a little bit more analysis to see if I can prove that causal link. Uh, well, certainly the correlation between the two, because um, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not proving, proving the causal link um, with science. I'm just looking at the data and drawing conclusions from it. Um, based on the correlations I can see and the subjective information, objective information I've heard from, from NHS experts. Picking my vaccination data, so I know how many people, how many adults had a first vaccination and a second vaccination at a certain point in time. And there's various things I can now do with this data. So I can just say, um, I want to pr provide an index of who's at risk really, so I want the sort of inverse of this vaccination rate. So I can just literally take the first vaccinations and say 100% minus um, the first vaccination rate to get 25 and, uh, and so on. So that's one way I could do this. Um, I could look at the average across first and second vaccinations and then take um, that off 100% to get a different measure. Um, and, you know, from what I've heard, um, both vaccinations are important. The scientific studies have shown that um, you do get an added benefit from each successive vaccination and therefore, you know, it, it's going to push me towards thinking I need to look at the first and second vaccinations. Um, but these are just purely the, the percentage of adults and um, the NHS didn't do the vaccinations just purely randomly. They did it very much on a risk basis. They looked at who was most at risk and they did those people first. So there's an argument to say I shouldn't just be looking at absolute numbers. I could instead say that you're going to capture all of the potential risk by doing the first 90% of people or the first 80% of people in the, in the country uh, in the country, and so on. So I've got various different metrics where I say, let's just assume 90% is, is everyone or let's assume 80% of is all of the risk and 70% and so on. And I can do the same calculation there, but just capping things out. So um, I never go above uh, 90 or 80 or 70. Um, and obviously then I need to change my uh, denominator so I'm not not dividing by 100% um, still, I'm now dividing by a lower number as my potential capped maximum number. Um, and then we can also say we don't think that vaccines uh, take effect immediately. So <laughs> there's a film Contagion, uh, which apparently the uh, NHS um, um, used a lot to <laughs> just to uh, guide how they uh, got into vaccinations and made sure they got in early and got lots of them, lots of different types. Um, but in there, the vaccinations is literally as soon as you've had it, you can start hugging people, everything's good. But in practice with COVID-19, that, that's not the case. So I've got various um, versions of the same data where I'm just lagging it by one week or two week or or more um, to again try and test the hypothesis about, you know, what, what's, what's the lag um, between having a vaccination and, and the beneficial effect coming through. So all of those different calculations give you <laughs> this whole massive smorgasbord of potential options for um, the, the unvaccinated risk that remains in the country um, from, you know, from um, the middle of, middle of January. Um, and so what I've then done is done the same thing just purely correlating, just doing a very simple correlation between the um, death rate. Um, so this is our index of deaths to cases um, versus the um, unvaccinated risk index. Um, and it's interesting because you can see that um, over here, if we assume that you only need to vaccinate 10, 20 percent of people. Uh, that's not a great correlation, uh, but once you get over about 50, 60%, um, you don't seem to get much of an additional benefit. Now, that might partly be because we haven't really got that many people vaccinated beyond that 60-70%. Um, but also, you know, the first nine bands, the key priority people, uh, which the NHS, NHS said would cover pretty much 99% of the risk, um, 
that was literally sort of 50% of people. So there's quite a, a strong sort of bias that that might well be a reasonable place to cut it and say you don't you don't need to vaccinate people beyond that to cut you know much more of the risk. Um, and I've looked at it on all data and I've looked at it the data just post the 20th of January. Um, again, because I think that's you know, probably where we've got lots of data and it's kind of more reliable. So if I just look at averages, um, you can see that um, in the all data, it's suggesting that 84% correlation or 78% correlation for the two week lag. Uh, if I look at just the more recent data, maybe a tiny bit of evidence that the one week lag is, is better, but it's pretty close. And I think, you know, again, a lot of the information I've had from the NHS suggests that, um, you know, it doesn't come into effect the, the benefit immediately. And so one week sounds a bit short. So I think I might hedge my bets and go for two weeks um, as the length between vaccination and being protected. Um, and, you know, that's again kind of what, what you do as an actuary, you sort of have to balance the information. It's not perfect information, it's just a correlation. And so you have to bring in other factors. So I'm saying, well, let's let's take um, the evidence that I've seen elsewhere and bring that into the analysis and say two weeks. And then if we look at the average correlation across all of the different um, potential options, there's just about a, a slightly higher, and it's very close, but it's just slightly higher looking at the capping it at 60. Um, so saying that you need to um, vaccinate 60% of adults to get pretty much to you know 100% of the, the benefit you know, um, to the country. Um, that's just a little bit better. So um, so my conclusion is, yeah, that's what I'm going to go for. I, um, I'm not going to look at the old data because um, there's limited information on cases, limited vaccinations happened prior to that. So I'm just going to use the 20th January data onwards. Um, I'm going to go for a two week lag, just about OK. Like I say, it could have gone one week, but I'm going to stick with two. Um, I think second vaccination is important. That's very much what um, the NHS has been saying and they um, you know, I, I want to cap out and say I don't. We don't need to vaccinate every single person to get rid of almost all the risk. Um, and obviously, there still is a tiny risk, but um, it's much, much smaller. And it's um, you know, you've got rid of virtually everything there. So that's that's kind of the level you need to aim for. Um, and 60 60 percent of people seems to be uh, the sort of point of inflection beyond which um, you know you, you've pretty much got everyone there. So I'm going to say two week lag, um, capping out at 60 and looking at the averages first and second vaccinations. And that gives me, uh, this is all our sort of huge smorgasbord of options. And this is the, the index, the unvaccinated risk index, which I get um, from doing it that way. And if I then compare that to the death rate relative to cases, you can see um, there's clearly a lot of volatility, but it's a pretty good um fit through there and it is indicating that the you know the risk now is is, is incredibly um low relative to, to where it was and in fact when the nhs got overloaded it went you know even higher than that in sort of late december early january 21. what's my what's my conclusions um from this analysis well the, the first conclusion um is don't take any COVID advice from me. I'm not a trained professional. I'm just doing this as an example just to show you what an actuary might do with this data and the kind of quick analysis you can do um, with some pretty simple Excel functions. Um, so please rely on the experts, the NHS, um, the Zoe app in the UK. Um, we all know who these, these experts are. And we've been seeing them on our screens um, for, for many, many months now. So listen to them, don't listen to me. Um, but you know my findings, so I, I can see a two week lag between cases and deaths and it's a really strong correlation. So that seems seems quite a strong conclusion. Um, I think and it's not quite as strong, but I think a two week lag between vaccinations and the impact on deaths um, is is about right. And you need both vaccinations um, to get your protection. And you know the fact that we've gone for a risk based approach means that we can actually target um, just 60% of the adult population to cover quote unquote all the risk and it isn't all the risk, um, but materially it is so from a mathematical perspective, but obviously any individual person it's it's clearly um, irrelevant to, but you know for the country wide basis 60% of all adults, which is roughly 50% of the whole population. Um, 
is, is about right for the UK. And obviously, if you're in a country which is younger or older or has a stronger or weaker healthcare system, you might need to adjust those ratios. Um, but, you know, for the UK, about 60 percent both doses is, is the milestone we need to aim for. And we're pretty close to doing that. Um, if we look at, you know, the dates we've achieved various milestones, we're over 60 percent of vaccines. Uh, first vaccines to, to adults. Um, we passed that uh, almost two months ago now, and it's taking us about um, two and a half months to, to then come back with the second vaccination. So if you add that 75, 76 days, you're going to get 19th, 20th of June as the likely date that we'll have got to what I can see from my model as pretty much 100% protection. And obviously, it'll then take a you know a couple of weeks for those vaccinations to take effect. So, you know, early July, um, we should be in a really good, safe position in the UK. And you could extrapolate from that. So, you know, we're, we're in the UK, we might be an island, but we don't exist um, in isolation, despite uh, some of the political things that have happened recently. Um, so, you know, there is a question mark, what should you do once you've got to that, you know, close to 100% um, coverage, what should you do? And, you know, there is an argument that you should stop vaccinating. Um, if other countries are more in need, you should be focusing on on sharing vaccines with those other countries because unless the world gets back to normal, we don't get back to normal. And if the world economy is damaged, then our economy is damaged. Um, so actually, you know, there's a massive moral reason to do it, and there's a mass, massive economic reason um, for us to be helping other countries. Um, and it's also, you know, indicating that it's all about risks. And you know, if you're a country which is just opening up to anyone and letting anyone have it or the highest bidder have it, then you're not actually solving the problem for yourself. So um, there's a conclusion there that, you know, we should be more altruistic as a as a country and as a as a world and, and help everyone um, get get enough vaccine into the right people's arms to to unlock and enable the world to get back to some semblance of normality. Um, and just to sort of close on a hopefully a high. Um, so the UK has been in some kind of lockdown since since uh, well months really, but certainly since uh, January. Um, and the final release of lockdown is meant to happen on the 21st of June. And from what I can see, looking at this, um, you know, if we've got that, got those jabs in the right people's arms, as we seem to have by about then, then you know we should be in a great position to to release that lockdown and you know there is some concern over the Delta variant there are case numbers coming up but if we really sever that link between cases and deaths then you know, we should be in a great position to, to to make make the final jump and get back to, to real normality and obviously anyone who's planned a wedding or holidays or wants to see vulnerable um, relatives or friends then that's you know hopefully fantastic news and we can, we can all get back to normal. I hope you found that interesting. That's just me bashing through some, some data. Um, do let me know in the comments if you found that interesting. And, you know, if you want to know more about being an actuary and the kind of things we do, you know, playing around with numbers in spreadsheets and hopefully drawing conclusions that are helpful to people, then, you know, check out my site and, and various others on, on YouTube. We're very happy to explain more to you about being an actuary. And uh, if you want to hear more from me, then click that subscribe button. I'd love to love to share more information with you in the future. Thank you. Bye.